Good morning, everyone, um, to this the seventh cyber watching uh, webinar. My name is Nick Ferguson, and uh, I work for Trust IT Services, and I'm the coordinator of the cyber watching project. Today, on today's webinar, we have a very topical topic of uh, GDPR and, a, and an area of uh, GDPR and compliance and its effect on uh, emerging technologies, basically. So this is an area which the Commission, European Commission are very interested in, how they can move forward, how the GDPR uh, will affect uh, emerging technologies and, uh, and will, it, will it block innovation, will it uh, slow down innovation or will it enhance opportunities for organizations working in the area. Oops. Uh, today we have um, presentations from a number of new projects which have just started out. I'll just go back a slide. You can see that the, the, the six projects which are all focusing on the topic of privacy and, and GDPR and we have um, six presenters today who are going to be looking at different areas of emerging technologies and, and GDPR. So the, each, each presenter has about uh, eight to ten minutes to present and then you can see in the uh, in the agenda we have um, a few five to ten minutes and we can be flexible on this I think to address any questions that you have during the webinar so who's online today where well, we we've actually got uh, th these these figures are slightly slightly in change now I think we've got just under 50 so we've got 48 registrants now uh, and you, as you can see, we've got a bit of a mix. We've got quite a few people from uh, from small companies online, which is which is really really pleasing uh, that we're reach, managing to reach out to you. We've and then we've got a, an even spread of, of, as well, a bit, a bit of a mix of people from uh, R&I projects, which I think reflects the fact that uh, a lot of the speakers online today are from uh, are, are working on these projects thanks to funding from the Commission. And we have a good uh, balance between uh, between male and females as well. So good good gender balance is there with good gender balance there, which is which is very nice as well. So a lot of people online. If you've got a question, um, then you can you can ask your question in the uh, in the chat box, which you'll see on the control panel. What we'll do after the first three quest first three uh, presentations is we'll stop for questions. Please indicate if your question is directed to one of our speakers in particular. We'll try to get through as many questions as possible, and if not, then what we'll do afterwards is try and work with the with the speakers to to get back to you on your on your questions. So please bear with us on on that. Just to say about the the, the cyber watching project, I need to need to introduce our project. If you if you don't know us, um, if you do know us, you'll see that we've got a very new looking website uh, we've spent a lot of time on improving out the functionalities on our website if you're from a project then you need to register on our website and take control of your project page we basically have pages and mini little mini sections for each project funded by the commission so that you have a new visibility opportunity and a way to communicate with with the broader stakeholder group if you're from an sme then we have a marketplace so here you can basically uh, promote your, your, your innovative services and, and products through our marketplace. It's totally free. And basically it's a new uh, place where you can promote the, the, your, your, your products and especially new services which you're perhaps testing or, or, or wanting to get out there. So it's very much focused on, on, on innovation. We also have... Um, a set of guides and, and best practices focused on and targeting the small business community as well. So check those out and uh, please do take time to register and register your, your organization and results. We have a, an event focusing on SMEs as well in Luxembourg on the 15th of October in collaboration with the European Cybersecurity Organization where we'll be providing training and training on how to pitch your, your, your results or your, your, your products to, uh, to investors. So this is focused very much on early, early stage investment um, for, for organizations. So please do uh, keep in touch with us and register uh, and you can keep abreast of everything that's happening really um, in, in the area. So what I'll do is I'll quickly hand over to my colleague Anastasia 
who is going to give a, a quick introduction to the topic of today's webinar. Anastasia. Thank you, Nick. Are the slides working? Um, yeah, they should be. If not, if you tell me when to change, then I can then I can change them for you. Okay, we'll do it like okay. that. All right. Okay, so um, I'm not sure if you are showing them right now. Okay. It's not yes, yes. Yes. All right. So um, the topic of today is very closely related to a deliverable which is uh, coming out um, very soon, hopefully. Uh, in the public eye, which essentially covers uh, the legal and policy aspects that um, may, be, uh, may be concerning uh, anything relating with emerging technologies. Uh, we, are, we, would, we would like to call for all the attendees to please uh, keep an eye out for, for this deliverable because it will be helpful both um, in order to get some first recommendations in terms of how can you approach compliance from a GDPR perspective um, as, a, as an EU project and also as a small and medium enterprise. So we would call for, um, for, for those that are interested to please keep an eye out on, these, on this deliverable. Uh, on top of the deliverable, we will be also providing two different tools, um, mostly focusing on small and medium enterprises. Uh, which will be more interactive uh, and will essentially serve as a self-assessment of um, measuring your risk to sanctions according to the GDPR. So that can be, of course, also very helpful for projects that are um, that are looking that are more innovative and are looking for ways to. Um, to, to mitigate the risk that they have to uh, getting sanctions uh, by the GDPR. Uh, so when we go into the, this uh, this topic, there is a, there is a lot of concerns that can that can come up. Um, some of which we may discuss today, some of which we may not. But uh, we wanted to kind of bring uh, bring up bring up some ideas of what concerns uh, and conflicts we may see when we think of data protection and uh, emerging technologies. Mostly, uh, the the slides we will bring up uh, next slide, please, uh, will be focusing on the Internet of Things. So uh, one big uh, topic that we also discussed in uh, in Brussels around a month ago. Uh, possibly with some of the projects that we'll be speaking today as well or will be attending is uh, the privacy by design and privacy by default which uh, which may uh, some may say that is completely contradicting the 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 nature the intrusive nature of a lot of emerging technologies uh, so what can uh, what can we do as um, as projects and as SMEs to ensure that we still comply with this this principle which has been uh, around for a very long time. Um, next slide, please. Another issue that may come up from a data protection uh, perspective is also the, the the issue of transparency. So how can we ensure that we adhere to the principle of transparency, meaning that um, we we inform our users and we inform the visitors of our users uh, of these emerging technologies that um, so that they know all the all the data protection uh, consequences that uh, this that the processing may have. Uh, next slide, please. Another uh, very important issue is how can we collect consent through devices or services that may not have a user interface. So, for example, smart homes or uh, smart doorbells, um, smart cars. Uh, how can we ensure that the consent is always there and it's a valid uh, type of consent according to the GDPR when the means of achieving and collecting consent may not be as clear? Or when these um, when these technologies are this intrusive to the extent that um, consent may not even be a possibility. Uh, last but not least, next slide, please. Uh, 
Uh, another concern that may come up is, of course, how can we ensure that our data subjects can freely exercise their rights? And uh, even though we have listed all the different type of rights that exist uh, for towards data subjects, a very important one, uh, which we have discussed quite in depth in previous uh, events as well, is of course the right to data portability and the right to uh, not to be subject to a decision that is based solely on automated processing. Um, so, of course, uh, it's quite uh, self-explanatory that especially the last right, which should allow data subjects not to be uh, subject to uh, decisions solely based on automated processing, um, completely contradicts um, a lot of emerging technologies. And the question is, is this right even uh, achievable when it comes to um, the GDPR uh, merging with uh, emerging technologies, or do we need to come up with uh, different technologies, um, different uh, opinions and guidance towards, um, towards the society, the data subjects, projects, research projects, and small and medium enterprises in order to give them a different solution of how this right can be achieved without undermining the data protection uh, and the freedoms and rights of the data subjects. So um, this was just a mere overview of uh, some basic topics that we have previously discussed and uh, are, are quite um, the hot topic when it comes to the emerging technologies and we hope that um, that the presentations today will be insightful and will help cover some of these points if not all thank you very much thank you very much anastasia uh, apologies um because um we weren't able to show anastasia's slides when when she was speaking um, the slides will be online um, straight after the webinar, so you'll be able to see them uh, there. So, what we'll do is we'll move on to the to the first uh, presentation from uh, Antonio Kong from Trialog and from the PDP4E project. So, Antonio, I will just uh, give you the presenter rights, and you can show the the presentation from your from your computer. Okay. Okay. Do you hear me well? Yes, hear you fine. You should see my screen now. Yes, we can see your screen. Good morning, everyone. I'm Antonio Kern from Trilog. Uh, I'm the CEO of Trilog. Uh, we are coordinating the PDP4EH 2020 project. Um, thank you for inviting me. Uh, just a word on PDP4E, Privacy and Data Protection for Engineering. It's a three-year project started in May 2018. We focus on model-driven engineering for privacy, taking into account uh, key aspects such as risk management, requirements, design and assurance. Okay. We will work on uh, two use cases that are on the verge of huge deployments the connected vehicle uh, use case and big data for smart grid. Okay. I'm personally involved in uh, standardization very heavily, security and privacy. And uh, within this, uh, I suggest I uh, submitted and initiated a study on the impact of AI on privacy. It was started in October 2018. We are seven rapporteurs. I'm the main rapporteur. And uh, it's interesting to see uh, the reference, terms of reference. Okay, we want to take into account current privacy standards, those that are published, those that are in the making. A current work carried out in SC42, which is a new group of standardization focusing on AI. Study domains where we have autonomous decision making systems, such as autonomous vehicles, robots, autonomous drones, and everything related. Okay. Of course, initiatives and projects on responsible research because we have ethical aspects, privacy to take into account, and research work. The output is to review this new generation of uh, AI based systems, identify the impact on privacy, review new threats to privacy which this can create. Um, review how we can improve, use AI to improve security and privacy and make a recommendation for standardization work. So I just want to show to you 
uh, the intermediate results of this work it will end uh, at the end uh, at the end of this year and uh, uh, we studied a number of references some of them so there are a huge number of documents uh, uh, let's say expre expressing concerns about this okay so we selected a few of them and i will present only three of them okay here in the seven minutes i, I have okay one is a CNIL contribution CNIL is a french data protection agency then there are two presentations which I made, one for Etsy workshop and one in uh, ITU uh, standardization workshop. Okay. So what is very interesting is this high-level view which CNIL provided on the high-level risk. Okay. So uh, what is in um, um, uh, in, in, the, in the black in the text is uh, the risk and what is in red is the origin, the cause, okay, the interpretation. So, of course, we can have an impact on human life, for instance, due to autonomous vehicles, and this could originate from design and learning issues, okay. Errors could be not anticipated because uh, deep learning is could be based on unfounded abstractions, okay. And you could also have profiling with or without automated individual decision making facilitated by deep learning. Okay? You could have discrimination or unfair treatment due to algorithm bias. Okay? You could undermine human dignity and free development of a personality due to algorithm bias. Okay? Uh, you could have no modification or control of what's going on in massive data operations. Okay? You could have also the problem of enforcing principles such as minimization or retention limitation in massive data operations and finally privacy measures could be inefficient insufficient due to attack capacity increase okay so uh, the next uh, actually contribution was uh, from me and uh, uh, where we, we make the difference between benevolent AI, you do you use AI for the good and uh, malicious AI, okay? So it's uh, interesting to see uh, this uh, map, risk map, which we use often to uh, assess uh, risks where uh, you have in one dimension, the likelihood and the other dimension, the, the impact, okay? So the ideal things is negligible likelihood and negligible impact. Uh, most risky thing is the maximum likelihood and maximum impact, okay? If you use AI, what you, you could achieve is to have assistance to reduce, to avoid attack, to reduce likelihood of threats, okay? So you, you get into one, uh, one dimension, okay? And the other dimension is, when you have the impact, you can assist it, assist to reduce the severity of impact. Okay, this is what AI can achieve to help uh, those issues. Okay, but of course uh, you have malicious AI, so you do the other way around actually. So uh, you could have uh, actually uh, assistance to to so that actually the security incident or privacy breach is more likely to occur. Okay. And of course, uh, you can also have AI to make sure that uh, it has more, uh, let's say, impact. Okay, this is really what we don't want to we want to avoid. Okay. Now, the last thing I want to mention is the issue of governance. Okay. And uh, so this picture here is showing, uh, let's say, in a nutshell, what is governance. Okay. So uh, on the left, you have a model. So you have a governing stakeholder. Okay, and uh, which applies some process to uh, monitor a system. So let's assume, for instance, a connected vehicle system. Okay, and then uh, in order to do this, you will establish security and privacy policies, and the system provider will uh, apply a life cycle process to follow the policies to manage the system assets. Okay, so an example is a smart city. In a smart city, of course, you want everything to run to run smoothly, so you will have a governance process to establish security and privacy policies. For instance, for a smart transport operator, which will tell him you should do that, okay? And he will do it, apply in a life cycle process so that actually uh, it will probably uh, protect properly uh, the transport system customer's data, okay? But now, uh, adapted to AI, so now it's a totally different story. So on the left, uh, what we have is actually we have a system provider that systems provides uh, uh, implement a system which is going to then make decisions okay so uh, what you want to have is to control and monitor process, monitoring process to control this uh, autonomous system uh, so you will tell him okay please uh, follow those security and privacy policies and the AI based system we have to have in internally a policy management process uh, to manage the assets he's handling okay 
So on the right, you have the example of autonomous vehicle, okay, where uh, the, 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 the autonomous vehicle manufacturer will apply a control and monitoring process and tell the autonomous vehicle, well, here are the safety and security privacy policies which you have to manage, okay? So there is a kind of delegation, and even my picture might not be that right, because the delegation is not only from the autonomous vehicle manufacturer, it's going to be from the whole community of the ecosystem, okay? And uh, what I have to say is uh, uh, we have two issues to solve there. Is first of all, we need to explain our decision explainability. Okay? So this is very well, uh, let's say, identified in the community explainability. But the second thing is not really well uh, identified, and this is one of the results of our study, is the governance. Okay? So uh, who is dealing with governance and what kind of governance is, is able to achieve? Okay? So, um, this is to conclude, uh, we are in the middle of the, the, the study and uh, the, the result will be, uh, for, first of all, what is the impact on the standards we are building and maybe we have to also to come up with other standards. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Antonio. That was, that was very interesting. Um, what we'll do, for, if you have any questions for Antonio, uh, we'll wait for the, for the break uh, between the presentations. Um, and now, basically, we'll pass over to Dario. Uh, Dario, yes. I'm making you presenter. Um, so if you want to put your slides up, that would be great. Uh, and Dario is from the Poseidon project. OK, so Dario, over to you. Uh, can you see my screen now? Yes, we can see your screen. Do you want to put it on? There you go. Perfect. OK. So let me hide uh, this, this part of the slide. So Poseidon stands for Permission Blockchain and Smart Contracts for Secure Personally Identifiable Information. Uh, sorry, just, uh, so what's the, the scope of Poseidon? Uh, the scope of Poseidon is to develop and deliver an innovative uh, platform uh, which aims to safeguard the, 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 the data of the, 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 the rights of the consent of the final user uh, using cutting and check technologies like blockchain, smart contracts, and uh, machine learning. Uh, what are the challenges that uh, we aim to? face with this project uh, the se securing the, the the digital identities uh, especially uh, supporting the reduction in identity frauds and uh, allowing the traceability of transactions on the permission over uh, the users uh, uh, personal identifying information and implementing uh, the gdpr uh, to assist the user in monitoring their their personal data the project is uh, is uh, is made of ten partners, uh, basically all over Europe, uh, as you can see in the small picture on the right side. So we have uh, uh, University of Coimbra, Technalia, Santander, soft team from France, uh, GIB, MPNO. Uh, we have Accenture, uh, the Ministry of Economy in Italy, and. Uh, 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 also, soon also Malta, Mita. Uh, so the overall project duration is, uh, is planned to be about 30 months, uh, ending up in October 2020. So the, the, the main expected results, again, is uh, uh, to develop this uh, platform. Uh, we want to... Uh, we want to manage uh, all the GDPR compliance, uh, trying to, to face also the different uh, social impacts in managing digital, uh, the rights in digital society, uh, increasing the use of privacy-driven solution, um, and also uh, approaching this project with the data minimization principle. So, uh, uh, alerting uh, privacy exposures and uh, monitoring uh, data authorization to the different partners. 
So what is the security challenge that uh, we started, uh, uh, that we wanted to face? Uh, the, the, our goal is to uh, empower the, the users in, in tracking and controlling and manage their personal identifiable information. Uh, and, and, and integrating this uh, uh, with the solution that uh, um, uh, mitigate also the risks of uh, doing something like that. Because the, uh, despite the, uh, the use of digital, servers, uh, digital service all over, uh, at the very end, uh, we see that uh, end users remain worried about their data privacy. Uh, as of today, we, we provide uh, consents and permission and data on, on, on all different platforms, but we don't have uh, um, we don't have a sort of a single dash where we can manage uh, the, 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 all this concept. You know? So the Poseidon approach, uh, thanks to the blockchain technology, mean, aims to preserve the integrity uh, and uh, manage all the consent. So as I said, uh, the, the idea is to use blockchain technology for to manage the transability of transactions uh, over the permission that uh, a user gives about his personal data through the life cycle of, of uh, his digital uh, services access. Uh, Implemented at the same time the GDPR to assist users in monitoring their personal data and uh, doing this, uh, we no, we don't we not only use smart contract blockchain, but uh, we integrate uh, the, the platform with the risk management module to that tries to instantly identify any uh, strange anomalies in uh, the data permissions and a personal data analyzer to that monitor uh, privacy risks. Um, as I mentioned uh, already, the, the solution is based on blockchain and cloud, and uh, but the other main goal is to act uh, is at the very end is that uh, um, acting as data, as data controller and data providers, uh, uh, the end user will be able to make a conscious decision about who can process their own uh, personal data. No? So by having a single dashboard, we're restricting a revoting permission uh, in, accord in accordance to the data minimization principle that I mentioned at the beginning. So uh, we are doing this uh, involving not only as a pilot user, uh, the, the municipality of Santander, uh, the Ministry of Economy in Italy, but also private organization, um, uh, which is soft team in France. So we try to make also an interaction between a private organization and government organization about uh, this topic of uh, personal data consent. Uh, of course, uh, the, the value is that to, we needed a European project to mix together uh, all the possible uh, business opportunities, not only for public, but also for, for private entities. Uh, making a project model that is replicable, replicable and scalable. And uh, we are trying to do this, uh, I mean, creating a, a great team of partners, uh, drawing up on each other's expertise and working uh, in innovation, uh, also organizing public events. We had a fantastic event at the University of Kimbra where we already shared and uh, discussed with some of the project that are old panel. And uh, if you need any more information, please look at the website of the project and feel free to contact me also. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dario. That was very interesting. And we've, we've actually got a question on, on blockchain, which we'll put to you, I think, after, uh, after Bridget's presentation now. So uh, thank you very much for that. Um, so just move on to to Bridget now. So, um, Bridget, I'm making you presenter so you can put your slides up. Uh, Bridget is from Karlstad University and the newly funded Papaya Project. So, I think the a really nice name. <laughs> okay, Bridget. Good over morning. To you. Good morning, everyone. So, I'm going to talk to you about Papaya. Uh, I'm working at Karlstad University and uh, who's the academic partner in this project. 
And the title of the presentation, sorry, is Protecting Privacy in the Thir Context of Third Party Analytical Services. So pa PAPAYA stands for Platform for Privacy Preserving Data Analytics. And uh, data analytics can leverage collected data and derive uh, relevant information. Uh, that provides valuable knowledge to companies, and I think all of you probably online uh, are aware of that and the potential. But process data are often highly sensitive, and disclosure may harm individual privacy. So GDPR obligates companies to protect the individual's data privacy while processing. So the Papaya solution is that privacy preserving data analytics modules uh, that can extract analytics and protected data using artificial intelligence. And developing such modules protects patients or protects individual privacy, can be cost effective and accurate. So back to just the objectives of Papaya uh, is designing for privacy. So uh, privacy preserving uh, analytics and uh, protecting, uh, pro uh, sorry, uh, doing the analytics over protected uh, data, processing the data. Uh, in, and doing this in different settings, be it for single data owners or multiple data owners and third party queries. Uh, this would use an integrated platform with a common framework and you know, really important that there's user control through transparency, usability and auditability. So what GDPR? Our challenges are, of course, explicit consent. You know, how can data subjects give or withdraw consent? Security measures, uh, pets, uh, privacy enhancing technologies are used to extract analytics from data. Uh, transparency, the data subjects can visualize to disclose data and their rights. And auto auditability, that data controllers can visualize audit logs and manage the DPIA. That's the data protection impact assessment. So I'm going to just go through a couple of use case examples. Uh, first of all, imagine a cloud service providing uh, sorry, um, providing the analysis of data through a third party. And an example we give is a doctor provides a patient with a device to gather data, maybe like an ECG, and the data is sent to the cloud service for analysis and a report goes back to the doctor and maybe the patient, depending on policies locally. So just to show it graphically, uh, the patient at the green box on the left hand side collects their app or tablet, whatever. And the personal data depicted in a yellow circle is separated from the collected data like the ECG. They're both come back to the premises of the uh, medical health provider, say like a pharmacist, where the data are downloaded. And the uh, ECG data the so collected data in the little heart shape is encrypted, sent off to Papaya, analyzed, sent back, decrypted at the MHP level and sent to the doctor along with who will have the details on the patient and compile a report that goes back to the patient. So that's the idea how it will work. On the second example, Oh, sorry, before going on to that, just to highlight the advantages of this is that the data subject's privacy is completely preserved. It never goes to Papaya. The analysis is kept separate. And the, but the computational burden is with the data processors. Uh, the other example we have is, again, the, third, the cloud service providing the analysis through a third party. And imagine a company provides staff with a wearable device, maybe like a T-shirt, to gather data about stress. That data are sent to the cloud service for analysis and reports back to the company and maybe the individual staff. 
Atlantic Canon policy. So on this uh, graphic, we show the uh, worker maybe collecting the data on their smartphone. The uh, data are all compiled at workplace level and sent to Papaya, where models are examined in the context of data coming from other organizations. Uh, a report is sent back to the workplace aggregate uh, workplace uh, in an aggregated form. So the advantage of this is that data subjects' privacy again is preserved. The individual's uh, information never goes past the workplace, and better models are built on larger data sets. So what we find in Papaya so far is that, well, first of all, healthcare already has a lot of experience of protecting in, uh, patient privacy and ethics. But their experience is largely paper-based and their privacy in the past was protect, protected by physical boundaries and local authentication. We find that medical staff are not so knowledgeable about the risks to patient data online. And people assume a trust in services and they assume accuracy. And we find that patients trust their doctors and their healthcare organizations. So this is challenging. And we ask the question, who is responsible for patient data? First of all, the doctor has a professional responsibility. The healthcare organization has a legal responsibility to ensure the systems are in place. Now there's various interpretations we find on different practices uh, among institutions. Some use cloud services and others don't. But one thing comes through is that doctors do rely on their organization to provide an infrastructure that they can use to protect the patient's privacy. And the patients rely on the healthcare professional. Uh, in all our research so far, that seems to be the case. Uh, and there's a personal relationship very often between the doctor and the patient, which is tied into that trust thing with the data. So in conclusion, uh, we feel that the third party service provider must deliver it an accurate service. That service provider must provide security and protect privacy. Uh, so we see trust and integrity is essential to any kind of cloud services like we're proposing. Uh, informed consent is still a concern. Well, you know, it's it's easy and at one level to get a consent from people, but uh, we feel that we could do better in terms of ensuring that it's informed consent. So I want to thank you and invite any questions you may have. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Bridget. So it's good, good to see what. So, so all of these projects, just to, just to let you know, all of these projects are focusing on. Um, Uh, look, can you hear me now? Okay. Hello. So thank, thank you very much, Bridget. Um, basically, all of these projects have different um, have different case studies which they're they're focusing on different areas. So it's good to it's good to hear that the uh, that your project is is focusing on the the, the medical um, the medical area. Uh, okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to um, have some some questions now. Um, so the first question uh, I'm going to actually give to uh, Antonio. Uh, and uh, Antonio, what are the main conflicts between uh, artificial intelligence and uh, the articles in, in GDPR? Ah, OK, so I would say uh, minimization is uh, very important because AI is uh, actually a big data oriented with big data aspects, OK? And also then I would say uh, the user empowerment. Uh, so I'm not an expert on legal aspects, but I would say that the GDPR certainly put push forward actually, first of all, minimization and also uh, uh, the, the user as the at the center. Okay. And those are two issues I think which are important. 
Okay, thank thank you, Antonio. And I also want to, I think uh, Andrea, you wanted to answer this this question as well. Yes. Can you hear me? Yeah, here you fine, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. And um the, the GDPR don't talk directly to the artificial intelligence because it's a general regulation. But in my experience, there is uh, one important point connected to the artificial intelligence. It's uh, a, an article at this moment, I don't remember the number of the article that talk about uh, the, um, that it's important for the in the GDPR the automatic decision uh, by provided by tools uh, for that involve a data subject. Uh, I think that the use of artificial intelligence is more connected to this article, and uh, uh, for for the GDPR it's important to ask uh, a formal consent uh, to the data subject when there are where is. Uh, including the processing and automatic decision. Uh, the, the, the GDPR, uh, uh, um, uh, my typical work is a consulting activity on GDPR, uh, cyber security, privacy, and so on. If I have a customer uh, that uh, asks me for this problem on the artificial intelligence that process uh, personal data, my suggestion is to follow the the process uh, uh, defined in the GDPR that uh, defined to identify the process, uh, the processing of the personal data, the, the, the tools that process this data, and uh, uh, evaluate the criticality of this processing and do a data protection impact assessment. And if it's the, the the treatment are not sufficient to reduce the risk for data subject is necessary to go to the national data protection authority to ask uh, uh, um, its evaluation of this processing uh, this is the, the normal process in the gdpr for the new tool for example um, about the artificial intelligence, uh, I think that the main risk for data subject is uh, related to the possibility that uh, an hacker can manipulate the input or the code of the artificial intelligence and uh, the result for data subjects is not the correct result. And it's, it's necessary, in my opinion, um, to include uh, uh, many security measures to reduce uh, this possible uh, risk uh, from uh, an hacker, for example. Obviously, it depends on of the type of personal data that the artificial intelligence processing. It's uh, sensitive or not. Yeah. Yeah. That, that, thank you very much. Yeah. Uh, a lot, lot, lots of issues, I think, which uh, and lot, lots of question marks as well. But clearly, um, clearly, I hope your 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 answer has uh, has sufficed. Uh, another question this time to to Dario. Um, Dario. 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 So. 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 Um, okay, so sorry, we had a wild, uh, wild echo there. Um, so the next question to is to Dario, um, and that is um, so personal data in in blockchain. Um, we need to avoid including personal data in, in blockchain, or do we need to avoid use, uh, including personal data in blockchain, even if it's private? Uh, are there any useful tips about how to use? blockchain comply which complies with the the gdpr so dario are you able to to pick that so, up uh, let me tell you the, what we decided uh, in poseidon project so um there was a i think there was a long discussion even before i joined the about this topic uh, right now on the poseidon project our 
solution is to uh, use blockchain mainly to manage uh, the consent the consents of the users but the data the private the private the personal data will be kept in the um, in the in the, in the data in on the system data source of the partner on which the user uh, gives the initial uh, consent okay then the, the consent is stored on our platform in, in the blockchain and our platform will know where the data is so but it uh, will not know the data so this is the approach that uh, we perceived in Poseidon Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. So what um, what we'll do now is we'll we'll move on to the next question uh, and then, sorry, the next presentation. Um, so I'll be handing over to to Davide. Davide, I'm giving you uh, presenter rights. So if you can yeah. put on your screen, there you go. Can you see that? Yep, can see that. And just want to put it on the big. Okay, there you go. Handing over to you. Thank you. Thank you, too. I'm Davide Cascone, everyone, and I'm a legal consultant of Beck and McKenzie Milan office. And more specifically, I work in the IT and data privacy department, and I'm working in the BPR for GDPR project, trying to analyze the main legal issues about uh, this task. As I already clarified, the GDPR is a really game changer in the European Union data protection legal framework. Uh, apart for, from GDPR compliance and financial penalties, organizations have an extra reason to adopt the underlying principles and appropriate measures for data protection. Uh, growing people awareness of data breaches and the increasing demand that companies protect their information. Apparently, several companies are still unaware of the regulations' implications or have difficulties in achieving a good degree of compliance. Um, for instance, the privacy role interpretation or security measures enforcement, uh, the management of the data transfer, um, more specifically outside the European Union, um, or how to deal with requests from data subjects. This is why this group decided to commit itself in BPR for GDPR, um, whose aim um, is to ensure the development of a technical tool able to support GDPR compliance ICT processes at various scales, organizational and inter-organizational inter level. Um, more specifically, uh, providing the tools and methodologies that will significant, significantly facilitate the implementation uh, of the appropriate technical and organizational measures, uh, and to ensure that data collection uh, and processing is performed in accordance with the GDPR. Um, the compliance approach of this project will consist in uh, automatically re-engineering workflows so that they become that the companies can become compliant by design, uh, whereas enforcement will be supported by an easy to deploy compliance toolkit, uh, providing the fundamental common function for photography, access management, uh, and enforcement of data sites, for instance. Uh, further, mm, the overall organizational compliance and underlying systems behavior. Uh, will be governed by a comprehensive policy-based access and usage control framework uh, conceived on the basis of the, the regulation and managing all the requirements thereof. Um, finally, BPR for GDPR will opt for enabling BPR for GDPR solution deployment on the cloud, uh, therefore providing for compliance as a service. So the, the the focus here is on cloud-based system. Uh, of course, BPR for GDPR aims at having a systematic approach that always bears in mind the legal implications, uh, starting from the codification of regulatory principles and requirements into a compliance ontology um, under, the, under the guidance of lawyers, so 
legal consultants, but also the, the Greek Data Protection Authority, uh, which is helping us in doing this uh, tough task. Um, this way, the, the project fosters facilitating the deployment of mechanisms addressing requirements that are pervasive in organizations that collect and process personal data. For each specific organization, this is a, a toolkit, this is an approach um, aimed at uh, comply, uh, giving, giving compliance in the several uh, business areas. Um, as you can see um, in this slide, um, we, are, we are dealing with different sectors where uh, data protection issues may, may take place. Uh, use case number one, for instance, regards privacy compliance in organization. They are characterized by certain features. Um, there are handling special with special categories of data, uh, so such as healthcare data, uh, for, for a large number of data subjects. Um, using an in-house information system hosting server um, and with a large volume and a heterogeneity of data. Uh, to this purpose, we are working on EDICA information system. EDICA uh, is a public owned company supervised by the Greek Ministry of Labor um, and serves as a, the IT solution provider for social security and welfare in Greece. Um, its main objective is to design, develop, operate, and support IT system for the social security funds and healthcare services. Um, the, the, the aim of BPR for GDPR is to help PDICA to identify infrastructure critical risks and provide a powerful tool to mitigate possible attacks. Um, it is clear that this is an area which is really sensitive. Also, due to the recent fine that was issued by the Dutch Data Protection Authority on a Haga Hospital, uh, 460,000 euros. Uh, for failing to implement appropriate technical and organizational security measures to protect personal data. Use case number, one, uh, number two instead regards cloud based CRM system uh, used by several organizations in the automotive sector. Um, cloud based automotive management is today distributed across different information systems spread in a complex ecosystem. Uh, with multiple stakeholders, car dealers, manufacturers, and or call centers, uh, which use the same cloud-based platform. In this context, uh, given the sensitive nature of the uh, exchange data, uh, for instance, from a tax uh, compliance perspective, uh, all transactions have to be uh, regarded with respect to the amount of information available to each stakeholder. Uh, there is different stakeholders must have access to different subgroups of information ruled by particular access control policies. Um, and the, the scenario becomes even more complicated considering the potential involvement of third parties. For instance, um, connection between third parties involved in digitalizing the uh, vehicle registration certificate. Uh, finally, uh, use case number three, um, regards uh, the use of software, which is called Vistonet, developed by Intempra, uh, a, software, a software house that access data processor here, uh, for Casa, which is a real estate agency, to manage their CRM. Uh, given the special business area, a real estate agency may collect lots of personal data in order to better meet clients' need and also try to make a profile, uh, profiling, profiling activity. Uh, the VPR for GDPR will try to help Visto Casa improve the processes of collecting and, um, such data uh, and, and also making the personnel more aware and prepared uh, from proper information management, um, reducing also costs and risk of error in the whole process. Digital compliance will, will also result to increase the data accuracy uh, and thus the, to higher communication efficiency uh, by fine tuning the CRM's database and making it easier to operate to um, 
manage uh, the access to data and the um, security level of that. Let's say um, it is lastly important to underline that whereas the issue of data protection has been so far synonym to security, the GDPR has also stamped the fact that privacy uh, beyond security um, requires uh, particular technical and organizational measures. Therefore, a new privacy market has arisen, um, has come up, along with dozens of startups uh, during the last years. In this context, the DPR for GDPR partners, um, which are uh, which covers um, some countries on the European Union, Italy, Germany, um, Greece, uh, Holland, um, would like to uh, um, gain a competitive advantage by providing the, the digital single market with innovative solutions and becoming market drivers. Um, the, the, the one of the most important aim, of the most important goal, is in fact the, the result in uh, strengthening the European technology competitiveness uh, in the privacy and the digital market. Thank you very much. This is, uh, of course, if you uh, if you want to have uh, more information, uh, you can easily contact me and uh, or my uh, colleagues visiting the, the, the website or also my email address. If you have any concerns or more other further question, questions of this, thank you. Wonderful. Thank you very much, Davide. And uh, we've got some more questions coming in, which we'll uh, we'll deal with uh, at the at the end of the webinar. One in particular on standards, and another further question on 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 management of um, well user consent on on privacy issues. So, uh, and it was good to hear in in your presentation, Davide, the aspect of the benefits for for the actual uh, the actual users. So the the, the people whose uh, whose personal data is is being managed. So um, thanks for that then. So now what we'll do is we'll uh, move on to Andrea. Uh, just give me one second. Okay, so Andrea is from the Defend Project. Uh, Andrea, you've now got um, presenter rights. So if you can put your slides up and uh, and then you can you can get going. Okay, can you see my screen now? We can see your screen and we can hear you as well. Thanks, Andrea. Okay, thank you. Okay, I'm Andrea Pratano and uh, I'm um, Cyber Security and Privacy Advisor in Matic Mind. And uh, in the Defend project, uh, my role is the project security officer in this uh, project. And uh, my main role is related to the security aspect of the project, but also uh, as part of the Matic Mind team, I'm involved in some part, technical part of the platform. Um, one moment. Okay, just a couple of uh, words on the Defend project. Uh, we are 10 uh, partners from many different countries in Europe. Uh, we are um, at the end of the first year of the project. Uh, next, next week, uh, we will have the first review of the project. Um, and now we are we are finished the um, the definition of the requirement, and we are uh, start uh, three months ago the development of the software for the platform. Okay, just uh, a, a very short introduction of the data protection, uh, the European data protection. Um, the uh, European data protection uh, is not a simple uh, single uh, law, but it's a framework uh, because we have the Article 8 in the um, Charter for the um, Human uh, the, the Charter of the Fundamental Right of the European Union that it's the very fundamental uh, article uh, that defines the data protection uh, uh, for the European citizen. It's a very short article. We are talking about four lines in this article. In the center, we have another 
part uh, in the core of the European Data Protection for, uh, Framework, we have the GDPR. Uh, in my opinion, the G in the GDPR acronym is very important because it stands for general. Uh, the GDPR uh, is uh, a law that uh, we need to apply in many different uh, sectors. We are applying GDPR in the public administration, in the industry, in banks, uh, hospital, uh, no profit organization, and so on. And uh, in big company and in small company, it's, uh, uh, it's, uh, mm, it's necessary many experience to apply the GDPR in this. In, uh, in, this uh, man, many different uh, type of organization. The Article 8 uh, and GDPR is the core of the European Data Protection Framework. After that, we have uh, other uh, law, European law, for example, the Directive 608 uh, related to the judge uh, personal data. And uh, this is uh, the directive that uh, if you, the organization, process this type of data, it's necessary to be compliant with this uh, directive. Uh, we have another important uh, directive and a draft of the, the new regulation. Uh, it's related to the privacy. We have, uh, at this moment, we have the e-privacy directive, the 2258 EC, and uh, the uh, European Parliament are working on uh, a draft uh, for the new e privacy regulation. This e privacy regulation is related to the personal data that are processed in an electronic way. If the organization process the personal data in an electronic way, it's necessary that uh, it's compliant to the privacy regulation when we will have the uh, privacy regulation and now to the a privacy directive. If the organization uh, process the personal data in a traditional way, it's not necessary the compliance to this uh, regulation. Uh, the GDPR, uh, the different directives are the law and uh, explain the uh, data protection concept at the high level. Uh, it's necessary to have uh, uh, some more details uh, for the implement, for implement the data protection uh, in the organization. And we have the guideline from the Working Party 29 and now the European Data Protection Board and the different national data protection authority. This, op this opinion are vertical on the specific topic, for example, for the execution of the data protection impact assessment, uh, the record of processing activity, and so on. Um, after that, we have uh, another directive uh, uh, that is the Directive 681 uh, uh, that is related to the processing of uh, the PNR code for the um, um, airplane company. Obviously, this, uh, if uh, uh, foreign airplane companies necessary to respect this directive. After that, uh, we have the different national law because we have the GDPR, it's a particular regulation. There are, uh, it's a regulation, it's applied, for, it's equal for the whole European company, but also there are some different uh, parts of the GDPR that it's necessary to specify in the national law. It's a sort of mix between uh, regulation and directive. And then we have a different directive, directive 608, 681, and the uh, directive uh, uh, 58, 2002, and before the e-privacy regulation. This is the, the, the framework of the data protection, uh, uh, European data protection. It's different to have a framework uh, to a single law because it's more complex. There are interaction between the different laws, uh, European law and national law. It's uh, a complex discipline. discipline. The data, in my opinion, the data protection in Europe is uh, multidisciplinary. At minimum, include uh, it's necessary to have a very, low, uh, very high law experience, uh, but also technical experience for the implementation of the security measure uh, to protect uh, the personal data. Uh, 
at the end, the, 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 the regulation, the GDPR, uh, in the GDPR, there are some uh, in, uh, indication that suggest that the data protection uh, is not uh, a static uh, uh, activity, but it's a process. Uh, for example, when the GDPR talk about the GDPR certification, uh, uh, include a reference to the ISO standard, the uh, 7065, uh, that it's related to the, the certification for uh, uh, product and process. This means that the data protection in Europe is a process and need a governance of the data protection. In my opinion, uh, the GDPR uh, have, uh, has a, a very little mistake uh, in the Article 32 related to the security of processing because uh, the, uh, in this article, uh, uh, the, the GDPR talks uh, correctly to the implement uh, appropriate technical and organizational security measure in the um, in, the, in the organization, but when uh, it, but after that, talk about the pseudonymization and encryption. Uh, it's strange for me that uh, a regulation include uh, some example of security measure and. Uh, Based on my experience, I talk with the many different privacy experts and privacy people in the organization. It's not clear that the pseudonymization and encryption is only an example of security measure, not the only security measure request from the GDPR. Um, and it's not, it's created some confusion that the example is not, it's a, uh, only on the technical part of the security measure, not on the organizational security measure. And uh, this, uh, this point creates confusion, in my opinion, in the organization for the implementation of the GDPR compliance. Another important point to work uh, for in the GDPR compliance is to understand what, what means uh, the personal data protection uh, in the G for the GDPR. In the Article 4 of the GDPR, we have many different definitions. What is the personal data, uh, what is the pseudonymization, and so on. There is not a definition of personal data protection. But if we check the different articles in the GDPR, it's clear that the, the a possible definition of personal data protection is to the preservation of confidentiality, integrity, availability, and resilience of personal data. We can use it as sort of acronym on CIAR. Uh, this acronym is very similar to the definition of information security that we have in the ISO 27000 in the point 3.28, where is the definition of the information security is the preservation of the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. This is the minimum three parts of, for the information security, but we can, uh, an organization can add other security, other aspects to protect. Um, about the data protection best practices, the GDPR is a law. We have uh, the different opinion that uh, provide the more details to the organization about how the organization can implement uh, some part of the GDPR, but uh, it's not, uh, there is not a real best practice for data protection. But the uh, aspect of the data protection uh, um, is very similar to the information security and uh, the community uh, have many decades of the experience in information security. And we can uh, move uh, the experience from the information security domain to the data protection. Uh, in, uh, when I... Um, teach in some uh, data protection course, uh, uh, I include all, always the definition of information security and explain the difference from the information security and data protection. The difference, in my opinion, is only the scope. 
because the data protection is related to the personal data. The information security is related to the information that the organization would like to protect, not only the personal data. There are many different uh, best practices in the world of information security. We have the uh, ENISA uh, guidelines, we have the ISO, ISO standard, on the, the first one is the, uh, the family, uh, 27,000 uh, family, 27,001, 2, 5, uh, and so on. The 22,301 uh, related to the business continuity, but we have also the OWASP, OWASP is an international association related to the web application security that provide, for example, the OWASP top, top 10, that is the, the top 10 for the vulnerability in the uh, web application. Uh, we have also the, the NIST, uh, the, it's uh, from the United States uh, organization, but in information security it's important uh, because um, there are there, there are many publications from the NIST uh, organization, and uh, in this publication we have uh, more details of how we can implement uh, uh, many security measures, technical and organizational security measures. But we have a problem uh, for the data protection best practice uh, because uh, in my experience, uh, uh, the, the GDPR correctly talk about the technical and organizational security measure, and uh, this is the same from the information security best practice, uh, but both are important uh, for the correct uh, protection of the personal data, but also for the protection of the information in the information security domain. But usually the organization are focalized only the first one on the technical security measure. And the focalization, the technical security measure uh, means that uh, the data protection uh, need to follow the technology change. And we know that at this moment when we are talking about the device, uh, the IoT device, uh, we are the new technology this uh, world is very uh, complex because they evolve very very quickly very fast uh, if uh, the organization focus only on the technical part of the security measure there are no priority or there are not the correct priority in the security measure this point is very important because uh, uh, the article 25 related to the data protection by design and data protection by default principles uh, talk about the evaluation of the uh, technical feasibility to implement a security measure but also talk about the evaluation of the cost. This is the very important uh, uh, aspect in the data protection uh, and in the information security because uh, the organization uh, have a limited budget and it's necessary to choose where we spend this budget, in which security measure. And the priority is very important for this uh, choice. The technical security measure without uh, an organizational security measure uh, usually don't work well. It's necessary to have a, a coordination, but there are many different uh, problems uh, in uh, if we if the organization uh, is focused only on the technical uh, security measure. What is the main problems uh, of the emergency technology? First of all, uh, the first problem is the life cycle of the product. When we are talking on the emergency technology, we have the problem that we have many different uh, uh, devices, new devices. We have um, smart watch, uh, sm uh, smartphone, tablet, smartwatch, but also we have many different type of the devices. And sometimes the, the life of these the devices is very short. These problem, are, uh, I will say the, at the beginning, my experience in the uh, cybersecurity in the IT domain and the OT domain and the industrial domain. In the industrial domain, we have a, a similar problem uh, uh, to the IoT, the emergency technology. The emergency technology evolves very fast. Uh, 
in the industrial, the devices are all very slowly. It's common to go to the industry and find a device with uh, over 30 years uh, of life, uh, operative lives in the industry. This is the, the, the same problem in the emergency technology, the device evolve very fast and in the industrial sector evolve very slowly and the security have the same, a similar problem. Another uh, problem uh, in the emergency technology is that uh, the focalization uh, of the data protection and the endpoint is complex and expensive because the device change very quickly. And uh, uh, there are not consolidated technology, but there are some leaders and outsiders. There are, we have uh, a very short number of the leaders, uh, the, the, the brand, the, the leader in the, the sector. Um, the, the problem is that uh, um, if, for example, if you have a, a smart TV in uh, your home, uh, I don't know if you go, uh, you went to the menu and find where is located the update of the software. Um, usually, um, very a very low number of the people go to the menu and update the software only when there is a problem. And uh, it's common that the update, if it's present, the update uh, of the software for the smart TV, but also for the other smart devices, it's only related to the update, the functionality, not the security aspect of the device. Mm -hmm. Uh, we have two uh, possible scenario in the organization. Uh, the first scenario is related to the corporate uh, owner person enabled. This, uh, uh, in this scenario, the organization have a direct control on the device selection, device configuration, and device update. This scenario is quite good because the organization uh, have a control of the device on the endpoint where it's, pos it's possible to process personal data. And usually the organization is not an early adopter. Uh, the organization adopts only a consolidated uh, devices. And usually we have uh, the business life of these devices. And this, usually the business life is not uh, connected to the technical aspect of the device, but uh, about the accounting. In Italy, usually the, the, time, the, the time of the, the life of the device is three years long. We have another possible scenario is the BYOD device scenario. And in this scenario, the organization has not a direct control on device selection, device configuration, device update. This scenario is not good for an organization. And for this reason, it's necessary to focalize the protection not on the endpoint but on the process and we have we can have many different technology many different brand and sometimes we have a, a, the some employee that have, are uh, that is an early adopter and have a very new technology without uh, and sometimes in the new technology the security is not the first aspect of the devices but also we have we can have uh, all uh, only also the employee with the very old devices. We have many different scenarios in this, uh, many different options in this scenario. How we can approach uh, the data protection? What is the good uh, approach uh, for the data protection in uh, my opinion? The organization, it's uh, the same if the data controller or data processor has the ownership of the personal data protection. The owner for the data protection is the controller and after that the processors, not the end user, the employee. It's necessary that the organization have a control of the different system, including the endpoint, the new technology using the point that can process the personal data. The, the, personal, the data protection must be under control from the organization and uh, is necessary 
take a decision, that the organization take a decision and can, could, the organization could authorize or deny the processing of personal data in, uh, for example, based on the role of the people, obviously this is a, a aspect of the law, but also based on the device used by the, the, the employee. For example, can uh, um, authorize the processing of personal data in the corporate devices, but not deny the processing of personal data in the personal uh, devices. Uh. For example, and, this is a good approach. Sorry, Andre, we're going to have to really, you're going to have to wrap up, I'm afraid, because we've gone. So this is Nick. If you could wrap up, please. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, okay. Only one slide after that. Okay. This is the, the organization has to implement the data for this reason. It's important to implement the data protection and the data process, data personal data process and personal data governance. Just two words on the Defend platform. The Defend platform is a platform that uh, has many different functionality. Uh, we have a, a part of the platform that is related to the data scope management. And in this part, we, have, uh, we are very close to the governance of the data protection organization. We have an assessment tool support for the definition of the processing, execution of the data protection impact assessment, and the implementation of the data protection by design and by default. This is the way where uh, our, the Defend Protocol can help, uh, the, can support the organization in the correct governance of the data protection. That's all. This is my reference. If you would like to ask me something uh, more on the project or on this aspect, thank you. Thank you very much, Andrea. Uh, that was that was very interesting, very detailed as well, and good. I, I really like the, the point about um, addressing the GDPR, both from a, an organisation and a technical point of view. I think that balance is very, very important, and also the point about the the life cycle of many of these emerging technologies products, which is you know, very, very short as we know. So um, what we'll do now is um, we're going to extend the, the webinar. Uh, I can see everybody's still online. So that's thank you for, for staying with us. Uh, what we're going to go to now is our final presenter, Rosa, um, who is representing the, the Smooth project. Um, Rosa, I'm making you presenter. Um, so you can put your slides up and, uh, and put and away you go. Thank you, Rosa. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Rosa Araujo. I'm from Eureka Technological Center in Spain, and I'm the coordinator of the Smooth Project. Um, I was also the coordinator of the Types Project, which was the gestation point of the Smooth. Uh, Smooth stands for GDPR Compliance Cloud Platform for Micro Enterprises. The GDPR has been effect in since last, last year and places a number of onerous cybersecurity and data breach notification obligations for organizations across across Europe with a strong enforcement powers for the data protection authorities. Compliance with GDPR remains challenging with today's uh, threats landscape, making the risk of data breach bigger than ever. The GDPR demands significant data protection safeguards. As you may know, non-compliance consequences are fines up to 20 million or 4% of the annual turnover. Our persisting challenge is translating legislative needs into technology de decisions. And most organizations are not yet prepared for compliance with GDPR. There exists a wider societal need for trust in digital environments. If uh, you want to be part of my supply chain, I need to feel confident that you are not exposing me and that you are compliant. This links to the principle of accountability. That is the ability to demonstrate compliance that you have uh, put in place records, processes, and technological controls that enable the organization to be transparent, transparent to the data subject, customer, and regulators. 
new privacy challenges are pushing the development of digital technologies. Some organizations are changing the data processes, workflows, and document management systems to improve data security. Uh, GDPR compliance is a vehicle to data workflows improvements and implementing new best practices, new work models, and new technologies can make a big difference. Major improvements in data governments across organizations, how to address the business need, but also how can I address questions addressed by the data subject on why and how you process my data. Full GDPR compliance because the databases are dynamic. Uh, the, data, the databases needs to be constantly re-evaluated and monitored. Data protection technologies can be integrated into processes to help to minimize the risk of security breaches, such as incorporating sensitive content into a regulated workflow as soon as data is received or limiting unauthorized access to officers' devices. Digital transformation adds additional pressure on technologies. The draw attention that GDPR gives to personal data means that even in your office applications, in your emails, work documents, the way it is the cloud, you can find yourself with, with hidden personal data that you need to account for. It's critical to understand the complete exposure, your complete data footprint, and try to manage that and to build a structure to put controls in place, to do it effectively for being compliant. And how security technical controls fit? Uh, this means, uh, what, where to know where uh, personal data is out and where is it. You need to know uh, what data your organization holds and where it is located. Locate all data stored in your desktops, notebooks, servers, network. Data scanning is crucial. What personal data is accessible and who can access it? Operational processes, training, and awareness across the organization is fundamental. Control who can access and share critical data files inside or and outside your boundary. Can we detect unauthorized access to personal data? As you know, violation, breach reporting, and analysis is mandatory. And for helping in all this process of implementing the GDPR, we are developing SMOOTH project. SMOOTH is an Horizon 2020 project funded under the digital security area that will finish in October next year. Our motivation is, uh, of course, GDPR, and we try to have SMEs and specifically micro enterprises. Why? because they represent the 99% of all businesses in Europe, and they are responsible of the 85% of the jobs, uh, jobs created in the last five years. Smooth goal is to help microenterprises to be compliant with GDPR through a cloud-based platform that has to be simple to use, transversal for any activity and sector, and affordable. The, <clears throat> the smooth platform is based on advanced technologies, based on machine learning that will automatically audit and generate a compliance report after the analysis of the of text. We will analyze the legal documents such as privacy policies, cookies, in front of consent. We will analyze also the databases to identify the presence of personal data and compliance with the legal principles of data minimization. And also, we will analyze websites and mobile applications for the possible collection of personal data by third-party companies that have access to the data 
and that may constitute a privacy leak. How the platform works? The user will be asked to fill in an entry questionnaire with the contextual information about the company. No need to be a legal expert at all. Then the user will be asked to upload the resources needed for analysis. This means the legal documents and the databases. And <clears throat> the different models will do the analysis. And at the end, a compliance report will be generated with uh, warnings about what to improve. Our roadmap, we are now in the, in the middle of the project and we have finished the requirements phase and started with implementation. We have recruited so far 84 micro enterprises that will be participating in the initial pilot. And at the end of the project, we commit to involve 500 micro enterprises for the market validation. Who is behind uh, Smooth? Uh, in the one side, it's Eureka that is the coordinator and is also the lead, leader of the platform integration. As technical partners, we have Naver leading with the text analysis module. We have NEC responsible for the databases analysis. Then we have UC3M, IndiA, and Listec developing the website and mobile app analysis module. As legal partners, we have Q11 and two DPAs, the Spanish and the Latvian DPAs doing a great job with the legal requirements. We have also in the advisory board, the Italian DPA. We have also a standardization body that is UNE and two SME representatives that are Funding Box and ESBA. And if you want to know more about the project or if you want to join our pilots, uh, here are the link to our social media media and our website. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rosa. So, um, so that concludes the, the presentations for the webinar. Uh, and, and thank you for your, your presentation. Thanks to all the speakers um, for, for their presentations. What we'll do now is have just a couple of questions that have come in during the, uh, during the, the, the webinar. Um, so the first question, well, the first questions focus on, on standards, actually. Um, and I think um, that, that uh, Davide, you covered some of the standards in, in your presentation. Um, but there, there's one particular question to, to Andrea, um, and that's regarding the, the, the NIST standards. Um, and the question is really around um, whether or not um, NIST is, is, well, the fact that the NIST is, is often very US focused. Um, so it makes it difficult uh, to influence the standards from an EU perspective. Um, and the question is, do, to, to Andrea specifically, do you think the EU should help EU-based standards that are more technical, similar to the, the NIST standards that you mentioned? So that, that's to, to Andrea. Okay, and um, in my opinion, uh, the, um, usually we, uh, when we work on the information security, we use a lot of the international standard. Uh, obviously, the data protection is uh, uh, it's different because the data protect the European data protection approach is different from the United States uh, approach uh, on privacy. And obviously, il, uh, I had some uh, the NIST reference uh, because uh, obviously it, I try to explain my usual my common approach when I work as consulting uh, as consultant. Uh, if uh, I work from uh, the uh, uh, obviously European company uh, for the compliance to the GDPR, uh, the starting point is the uh, Europe. Approach uh, on the data protection and also on the information security. The, the first point uh, usually is to observe the GDPR. And if, if I talk with the only uh, Italian company, because I'm, I'm uh, living in Italy, usually my customers are from Italy. 
And if uh, the starting points, uh, my, my customer is the Italian company, the starting points are the GDPR, but after that, the specific guideline for Italy. And if it's not present guidelines from Italy, I go to the other European countries. If it's not present guidelines from the European country, I go to the internet, to the world. In this, I think that this is the correct approach for the best use, the best practice in data protection. We need to start from the European experience, and the first point if it's present the ENISA standard guidelines or other documentation. This is the the best starting point for the implementation of the information security and data protection. But the, if you compare the ENISA documentation and the NIST documentation, in the NIST documentation there are very uh, there are many special special publications with more details. Obviously, if I take information from the NIST special publication, it's necessary, it's necessary some work to the contextualization of this uh, uh, security measure in the European context. Uh, this is the, 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 my, the, my usual uh, common approach. I start from Europe and uh, if it's not present in Europe, I go to the, to the world and in special case to the NIST. Because the, the, the special publication from NIST, uh, that there are very many different publications in many different sectors. I know that the approach is different uh, and it's important the contextualization in Europe. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think, um, thanks, thanks for that, Andrew. I think Davide wanted to add something as well. Yeah, I, I just would add to the fact that maybe um, we will have a more EU focus uh, approach. We may look at the, what ENISA is uh, actually doing in the environment of standardization. I know that the, um, maybe right now NIST and also uh, the um, organization from other countries around the world, for example in Australia or New Zealand, are um, providing some really uh, detailed technical advice on standardization uh, and also I think a cross work um, may be useful starting from the, as to what NISA, for instance, uh, has done in the, the field of the standardization. Because I think that um, a European Union agency has uh, um, a more detailed and more comprehensive uh, eye on how the um, European, what is the European Union legal framework, how it works, and how um, to come to match to combine it with the other um, uh, the other tools the other um, documents and other standards um, already already defined in other countries so yeah i think that the combined work between enisa and the, the uh, and the other authority around the world Thank you very much. Um, and I just um, just wanted to share also with you. There's a there's a, a project, an EC funded project, um, funded by the by, by the European Commission called Stand ICT. Uh, and in that project, um, you can you can actually um, well they, they basically have open calls for standards work, um, so that you can apply um, to 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 the project. You have to identify uh, basically what standards you would like to work on and you can apply for various uh, sources of, of funding basically um, through there's basically a cascading grant scheme uh, uh, which is the, the the main backbone of the project so the the objective of the the project is to encourage uh, more Europeans to contribute to, to standardization efforts 
uh, including um, you know the, those which were where perhaps a European uh, perspective is not uh, is is not you know is 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 missing perhaps so so that's an important project for you to to all know about. Um, okay, so we're 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 coming to an end. Um, I'd I'd like to just uh, spring a, a a question on to our uh, to our speakers. Um, so that you know we've we've heard some of the some of the challenges that that have faced with the, with the GDPR and the and emerging technologies. We've heard about um, the different perspectives as well that organizations need to take into account, you know, technical challenges, but also organizational challenges. We've heard about, um, you know, the, the types of organizations which, which, which is basically everyone who needs to be uh, GDPR compliant. But what the, the question is to each of the, the, the panelists, um, what, what priorities? So if we think about the the new uh, funding programs, so that we have the Horizon Europe and the, the Digital Europe program coming coming up. What are, what are the priorities? Uh, so, what do the do the policymakers um, need to focus on um, to improve the, the the current situation with these emerging technologies um, coming out? So, um, who would like to answer that first? I think it would be quite good if if each of you could give your perspective in under a minute, please. So please keep it keep it short. Who would like to go first? Maybe I can start. Go ahead. Thank you. Yeah, um, I think that there are lots of uh, issues and challenges that uh, um, there are coming up in these days. Um, artificial intelligence or blockchains or um, face recognition or something like that. Um, but for instance, I would like to uh, point on uh, one pretty new um, technology while dealing with um, advertising. Uh, I think that one of the like, one of the um, emerging technology in this context is the advertising technology, uh, the Aditech, uh, which is um, mm, which is carried out carried out with a mechanism of real time bidding. Uh, I know that some data protection authority are not already uh, keen on this uh, issue, but for instance, the ICO. Um, has recently uh, issued a, a re um, report on this uh, because the real-time bidding enable uh, uh, the buying and selling of advertising inventory in real time um, on an impression by impression basis, um, working like a sort of auction between publisher and um, advertisers. Uh, in a really, really um, little amount of time, we are talking about less than seconds. Um, there are tons of uh, stakeholders involved, and actually, it's, it's very difficult to, to deal with privacy issues because of lack of clarity of which are the, 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 the privacy roles of the stakeholders. Uh, and also um, a lack of transparency because uh, this is a, a privacy that involves includes a tons of data, maybe also um, special categories of data, and that uh, the privacy policies and privacy notices um, do not talk about it anyway. Um, so uh, I think this is one, and not the priority, but one of the most important things maybe. Um, we can deal it. We can deal with it in uh, the, the next days. Thank, thank you very much. Thank you very much. Um, okay, so that's a that's a, a well a new topic actually. Uh, so that's that's very interesting. Um, and uh, who would like to pick up the the question next? Any of our panelists? Yeah, this is Rosa. Hi Rosa, I, thank you. I think it could be good more efforts for adapting GDPR to each of the verticals of, of activity, 
to make it more easy for companies to summarize the main GDPR aspects for sectors or uh, per size of company so that they don't get lost and so frightened about the adoption of the GDPR. Okay, yeah, good, good, good idea. Yeah, some more advice to organizations so that it's easier for them to uh, to deal with it. Um, any of our, our other speakers? I know Antonio had to leave, but um, Dario, Bridget, or, or Andrea? Yeah, I, uh, this is Bridget. Uh, just to say that some of the things recurring in, in our research when we're talking to people is uh, some sort of oversight or place of you know, as companies set up and providing services, you know, how does the public know that they're trustworthy? So some sort of system of registration or licensing uh, they would like to see in place. And uh, a lot about building trust with the public. And the point is made like that if if there's one bad company out there, it, it, will, it will affect everybody in that business. You know, so if there's, you know, companies try, uh, genuinely providing good services through the cloud and protecting people's privacy and then someone comes along saying they are but they're not that it undermines the whole industry and um, so that was one of the things and the other thing is about informed consent how do we know who's on the other end of the of the keyboard and uh saying that they're okay with their data being handled in certain ways and do they know what they're doing so uh, we don't have a, an answer to that but there are people working on it I know in different projects across Europe and elsewhere but uh, we look forward to more developments in that area. Brilliant thank you Bridget that's a very good point about the, the you know um, encouraging kind of best practices in in, uh, in industry in particular where it's perhaps a bit more difficult to have top-down rules um, and encouraging a, a culture of uh, good practice is possibly uh, uh, something that would be would be nice to see. Um, okay, so um, Dario and Andrea, do you want to, do you want to, are you able to, to respond on the question, what the priorities could be for future funding programs? Yes, uh, it's Andrea. Um, I, I agree with the colleagues what uh, the colleague said uh, before me. I think that I would like to add a little, uh, a bit uh, to this uh, discussion. I think that uh, based on my experience uh, on the data protection and privacy, uh, it's very important the uh, awareness uh, of the citizen uh, and the uh, organization uh, because uh, in, in my experience um, in Italy for example there are many citizens that uh, ask to the Italian data protection authority to protect uh, to protect his or her privacy but uh, the first uh, step uh, for, protect, uh, for, for protector or privacy is the citizen, it's uh, our action. And it's important uh, to uh, improve the awareness on privacy and data protection and uh, information security in general to the citizen and the organization. Usually the data protection uh, and cybersecurity is not a priority. In, uh, for the um, citizen and for the organization. I think that this is uh, another important point uh, uh, where the, the Europa can work. Okay, thank you. Thank, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, yeah, that's a very good point. Also the fact that in Europe, we, we kind of expect privacy of our personal data, which isn't quite the same in, in other parts of the world. So this is a real, European challenge uh, that, that we have. Um, I think it's just Andrea, I think, who needs to... Uh, we, Andrea, would you like to comment? Sorry? Oh, no, sorry, uh, Dario, sorry, yeah, Dario. Yeah. Sorry, apologies. <laughs> okay, no, okay, so what we'll, I'd like to do is I'd like to thank all of our all of our speakers uh, and also you for, for staying online with us. We've gone 
over time, but I think it was a very worthwhile uh, uh, webinar today. We could lots of new things which are happening with these funded projects, new challenges to be addressed, uh, and, and new ways forward to uh, on on what is a, a you know a real a real uh, topic that needs to be addressed with the emergence of new technologies in, in this very moving uh, and uh, uh, challenging area. So. With that, I'd like to thank everybody for, for, for joining. Um, I'd like to also uh, just uh, encourage you all to uh, you know, keep in touch, register on our, on our website if you're a project. Then as I said, there's the new Project Hub, which we'll be writing to you all about. If you're a company, then please register on the marketplace and get your, your services uh, up on the marketplace. Um, extra visibility, basically, and hopefully we can help you find new uh, new end users. So with that, um, thank you everyone and uh, until the next time. Bye-bye.